Okay, for those that uh, you may have seen some of these slides before, if you're a uh, repeat attender, um, this is uh, a little history on the Aerostar, and then we'll get into some specifics. So the original designer, Ted Smith, uh, wanted to, he, he had an um, extensive history with Douglas Aircraft, but he designed several airplanes, and the Aerostar, uh, he wanted it to be an affordable piston twin that's faster, safer, and more dependable, and more comfortable than any other airplane available, so he set out to design the Aerostar. And his experience was with Douglas with the A-20, Havoc, that's the one at the very top there, flying in formation with the Eurostar. And then he started the Euro Commander Company, which was basically the first general aviation aircraft company right after World War II. Um, he, he finished with the uh, Jet Commander. Um, and the story I heard was the Jet Commander was going to be a personal sized airplane, and then the corporate office kept saying, well, we need a couple more seats. Can you stretch it? Can you do this? Can you do that? And he finally did get the airplane certified, but then he set off on his own to, uh, to design and build the Aerostar. And um, the one thing that, uh, and I did see some photographs, I wish I had one, but it was uh, a picture of the Aero Commander with one fan jet engine hanging underneath the wing on one side, and a turboprop engine on the other. And this was a fan jet engine that was developed by uh, Turbo Mecca. Um, and he designed the Aerostar so it could use that engine, the fan jet engine. And this, this was, you know, 30 years ahead of his time. He was going to make the first VLJ, very light jet. Airplane, so he designed the Aerostar to take those kinds of speeds and loads, and this was his drawing. Um, he was trying to raise some money uh, to start the company, and he had this drawing and several others, um, and he was trying to promote this concept. But he was successful in raising some money to build the airplane, and part of the changes. That he, or part of the differences between the Aerostar and the other airplanes of its time was he had a, a 6,000 series airfoil, which was the same as what was used on the Learjet. Um, and the thickness of the wing uh, is important on a jet because you're trying to you know, indicate 250, 60 knots in cruise. And so it was a pretty thin section of airfoil. The, the Learjet was even thinner. Um, but typically on, say, the uh, Beach Baron, they have a 16% uh, thickness ratio where the Aerostar was 12% on the wing and 10% on the empennage. And also the wings on general aviation airplanes at the time had a twist distribution in them where the Aerostar didn't have any. So it was really designed for high speed. Um, there's a picture of the tail and how thin it is, of course. And he went with his mid-wing configuration for low drag. I think it was more of a trademark thing. I'm not sure you can determine that the drag is less on the mid-wing versus high wing or low wing. But that was a trademark design that Ted had come up with. And of course, um, you wanted the airplane to be really rigid for these high speeds. And I guess they call it aeroelasticity. A jet needs to to be really rigid, and so that, um, that's why he went with the thick skins and fewer parts. He was also interested in the cost of manufacturing, and that's where he came up with the three tail sections are all the same, and the number of stringers in the wings were way less than a beach baron due to the heavier skin construction. And he thought that was going to reduce the cost of the manufacturing the airplane. So in 1970 or 63, he came out with the airplane, and uh, he ended up with a, a 600 type design. But they they called that uh, I think the 360, and the 360 had two 180 horsepower four-cylinder piston engines. Now, even a designer like Ted Smith 
you know, he estimated the empty weight to be around uh, 2,500 pounds, and it was really 3,500 pounds. Okay, so he needed some six-cylinder engines. The 360 wasn't going to do it. Even though they flew the airplane, here's a picture of the first airplane flying. It didn't have the, the fin in front of the vertical fin. And uh, I don't know if you can see the little, um, these were the air intakes for the passengers. So they had those little flush inlets. This is for the fuel tank. But these were for the passengers for air. And they had a, a cow flap system or an open exit there on the top. I'm not sure. They didn't have that very long. I'm not sure how that worked out, really. I don't think it did at all. It was certified. Yeah, there's a type certificate for that airplane. 110 gallon fuselage tank in that airplane, and the wings were dry. And then he had to put bigger engines on because it, I think it actually, I think they crashed this airplane on the runway. They were doing flight testing. On the first airplane, the FAA was flying the airplane and they stalled it in from 20 feet and drove the struts up through the wings so they had to haul it off and build a new one but you know everything has setbacks and they they overcame it this is interesting they you know here it is 19 i guess the certification let's go back the certification on that airplane is 1967 for the 360 and in 1968, they had changed the engines and turbocharged the airplane and had it certified. So, in a, you know, about a year, they made a double engine change and turbocharged the airplane and had it all certified. Uh, now, back then, you could get approval to certify the airplane yourself as a company, but Ted always relied on the FAA, and he said, you know, we're going to build this airplane way past minimum standards. And we really don't think certification is going to be an issue. And it really wasn't for them. And like I said earlier, the flight testing of the airplane for some major mod, maybe it's only three days. It's working up to the point where you're going to pass all the, right, all the tests. That's the hard part. It takes the most time. Now, as soon as he got the airplane, I think the 601, shortly after that, the investors that he had in the company decided to sell it and take the profit. And so in 1970, they sold the company to Butler Aviation, or to American Cement first. And American Cement was a company that made cement, and they decided to diversify, and they're going to make airplanes. So I don't think they were very successful in doing that. In fact, they never made any airplanes. But... Um, they did, they did uh, contract with, they had a lot of cash, evidently, and they contracted with Ryan Aircraft Company to make 150 sets of wings because they're going to crank these airplanes out like shopping carts, you know, and, and it's a high-value added product. You just assemble some sheet metal and sell it for a big number. But they never were successful in doing that, and... There was a, a fellow that worked for Butler Aviation, um, and he evidently talked American Cement into selling the design to him uh, for his company, Butler Aviation. And um, the story I heard was that the first payment was going to be ten million bucks, and they never were able to sell. They bought all the airplanes that were already built, and they tried to sell them and they weren't successful in making the first payment, so American Cement got the airplane back. Okay. Um, and Ted Smith was out, and he started his own little mod company, but he always had designs of coming back into business, and he came out with, uh, this was a magazine article written back in the 70s, early 70s, where he was no longer involved with Aerostar, and he said, hey, I'm going to come out with a new airplane, and we're going to make some improvements, some changes to make it easier to manufacture, and we're going to make it bigger. So it had a bigger fuselage cross-section, and he had a uh, um, crucifix tail. Whoops, there's the airplane. But uh, he had more like a 421 size cabin in the airplane, and um, geared engines. He was looking at geared engines, and he also had a jet version of the airplane plane. 
end, I think you can see um, right here where he had a ring spar. Um, the engine was buried in the wing, and he still was a jet guy, okay? He still aspired to have a jet version of the Aerostar. But anyway, he built this airplane. He called it the uh, Superstar, and it had the uh, Aero Commander uh, window, big picture window, and the emergency exit, and the overhead, and, and uh, I heard that he, and the cruciform tail, and I heard that he went to American Cement and said, well, I'm going to build this Superstar, and your Aerostar is obsolete at this point. And so he negotiated a pretty good price and bought back the company. Uh, here he, he talked to the Aerostar Owners Association, and the association was formed back then to support the Aerostar when it was out of production. American Cement owned it. They didn't know how to make airplanes. Owners were having trouble getting parts for their airplanes. They were all pretty new. 1972, is that right? Yeah, about okay. 1972. And he reacquired the assets in 1972. And then, instead of building the Superstar, he just went back into production with the Aerostar because it was all certified and ready to go, and there was a market for it. Uh, this is the um, this is the final assembly hangar where um, actually the next slide. This is in the manufacturing building that was off airport, and they would build the fus all the detail parts, and they build the fuselages here. And then they put them on a trailer and truck them over to the World War II hangar at Santa Maria. And that's where they put the wings on. And uh, after they ran out of wings, they built the wings in that World War II hangar. And they had a production line, and all the airplanes were made about the same. And if you, if you wanted a Century 4 autopilot or a King autopilot or an air conditioner or whatever you wanted, boots and... Um, they, all, they built all the airplanes the same, and they didn't even put in the wiring for the options. And then they sent the airplanes to, uh, sometimes went straight to paint shop, sometimes they went to the mod shop. And that's where I worked when I went in to apply for a job at Aerostar. I walked in this big hangar and talked to the shop foreman, and I said that I wanted to be a tech rep. And he said, well... We don't need any technical representatives because we don't have any problems with our airplane. Uh -huh. I said, okay. <laughs> All right, well, we may be about to have some, but we didn't have any at the time. And he said, so you have an AMP license, you can work in the mod shop. And I thought, mod shop? I thought this was a factory. What are we doing <laughs> modifying airplanes? Well, they modified every airplane to put it in, put in the equipment that the dealer wanted. So they'd get a list, they put it on the side of the airplane. Okay, this is going to Henry Weber, and he wants dark tint windows in all his airplanes. So they put in the interior in the mod shop, and they put in the hot props. We'd run the wires with a piece of piano wire strung out through the... I mean, everything was hard to do. It was 60 hours a week minimum required to work there. And uh, they never did really... Get a very efficient production. What year was this? 73? 73. Okay. Yeah, and then along came in 74 the first pressurized airplane. And I was there when they first pressurized. The... Now, Ted, um, previously, when he was not involved with the Aerostar, he pressurized an Aerostar, and he did actually five of them, a retrofit pressurization system to six air, the five airplanes. And he sold those to um, Hess Marketing and Henry Weber. And then when he bought the company back, of course, he wanted to build the pressurized airplane from scratch. And our first Superstar was actually a retrofitted pressurized 601. And it had 3.25 PSI cabin pressure. Um, but anyway, uh, that's a picture of, uh, of the plant where they manufactured the... Uh, fuselages, and of course, they were competing with uh, Aerostar, Beechcraft, and Cessna, and he had his, he was a marketing guy. Ted was a real promoter, and um, he had a really good uh, technical writer who explained to people, and it was pretty convincing, and he, he sold a lot of Aerostars to people that had loonies, 
and A-36 Bonanzas, their next airplane was either a Baron or an Aerostar or a Cessna 340, so he focused his marketing on competing with the Baron and the Aerostar, or the, uh, the Baron and the Cessna 340. He still had a passion for, um, he, this was the prototype superstar, you see with the cruciform tail, and he stretched the fuselage one section, so it was now an eight-place forward seating airplane, and we had eight-cylinder Lycoming engines on the wings. And in keeping with his design philosophy, this was going to be called the 800, because it had eight-cylinder engines, 800 horsepower, 8,000 pounds, and um, eight-place. Is that the airplane you have, Jim? Actually, um, that airplane was sent to Emory Riddle by Piper, and they just basically destroyed it sitting on the ramp. And I traded an engine for it and trucked it up there, but it wasn't a, it wasn't could never be made airworthy again. Right. Um, but it, in 1976, that was the 800 flying, and one of the test pilots that I knew from back then. Pat Barnes, Pat stopped by our facility in Coeur d'Alene 20 years ago, and I said, Pat, how was that 800 to fly? How much was it? He said, it's the same. It's the same. Cruciform tail, longer fuselage, eight cylinder engines. How was it? He said, it's the same. <laughs> so it didn't, it didn't have any different flying characteristics than the, the existing airplane. Well, this had the night, the the uh, 1976 um, centennial paint scheme, 200 year uh, paint scheme, but unfortunately Ted um, was, died on the operating table in 76 in December. He had a heart uh, issue, and, and but he did say that he was, and this came from a brochure, an older brochure that I found, and so he was pretty uh, comfortable with the fact that the airplane found its place in general aviation. You know, I saw it fly several times, but I never knew. Uh, I'm going to say it was uh, a quick calculation. will tell you that if the 600 goes 200 knots, the 800 would go 220. But up at altitude, if the standard airplane went 220, the 800 would do 240. And it was tur turbocharged? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So the family, I understood, couldn't really afford the uh, inheritance tax in California. And they put the airplane up for sale. But in the meantime, they were still making and selling airplanes. And Ted's son was running the company, Ron Smith. Oh. And uh, they, I think they switched advertisers, but um, they were still trying to sell the airplane, and we we're doing about 120 airplanes a year, maybe in that time frame. Did you work for Ron as well? Yeah. Okay. Well, he ran the company. I didn't. Did interact you run it with before him. Ted died, or? Uh, Ted or ran it until he died, and then Ron took over. Okay. And, you know, we never interacted with. Nope. Nobody in my department interacted with Ron. Not very long, I mean, before the next meeting. Yeah, was it? Okay. So they had some clever marketing still, and um, he also came up with this hurry up and wait, the airplane's fast and it carries a lot of weight, and this was their 601B, they called it. It was an unpressurized airplane, but it had a 2,000 pound useful load. Now also with the 800, the wing was the same as the 601P. So when we did a gross weight increase, we didn't really have to change the wing at all. Most airplanes are built to some minimum standard, and 
as an A&P mechanic, that's one of the first things they tell you. Never work the minimums. Well, if you're working the minimums and you're just a little bit low, now it's no good. So you always want to have it stronger than you think. And then if you it ends up not quite being enough, then it's still good enough to, to certify. But um, so... In 1978, they were successful in selling the airplane to Piper. The family sold it to Piper. And they were, they kept everything in Santa Maria and they built a brand new plant on the airport and promoted the airplane. And um, pretty much everything stayed the same except the price went up. They put up big banners in the, in the, manufacturing facility and it said Piper more airplane for the dollar well it was actually more dollars for the airplane that's how it worked hey, Jim when did you when did you start mocking uh, 19 I didn't start it no Steve I guess yeah. Steve started it and uh, clear mm -hmm. back in the 70s but 78 was that when you joined them I joined them in about about 77 77 Okay. Yeah, now they that mocking company they had two engineers but they didn't have any marketing people and uh, when I came in I was more of a salesman not an engineer and they had already made an aero commander the aero commander 112 they had taken out the 210 horsepower engine and certified the 300 horsepower Lycoming engine in the airplane and it made the airplane a lot better, but I remember the F.A. test pod, who was a dyed in the wool beach guy, <laughs> and a really good guy. Uh, I remember he said, yeah, that uh, Aero Commander goes as fast as a G36 Bonanza now with a, with a 225 horse engine. But anyway, they put that airplane, that mod together, and uh, they... They were demonstrating the airplane, and they took off with a couple people in, to demo it, and the engine quit, and they landed in a field and went through a chicken coop, and everybody survived, and nobody was hurt. Except for the chickens. Well, I think <laughs> they were expendable. but uh, So that put a damper on the sales, and you couldn't sell one of those Aero Commander conversions. Well, it turned out that it had nothing to do with the engine, other than back then, now the EPA guys would go crazy if they knew this was the case today, but it had a, it had a, a fuel drain system. You sit in the cockpit and you reach in between the seats and you pull up and it drained fuel out on the ramp. Cool. And then you, you release the knob and it didn't quite close. Oh, and so it sucked air. And the engine quit when they were, you know, 100 feet in the air. And then my partner today, Steve Spear, him and Hugh Evans were partners. And Steve said, well, I guess I better go get a job. We can't sell these. And so he went to work for Aerostar. And that's where I met him. And he was a pretty sharp guy. And they understood that. And they made him chief of structures for the 800. So he was there analyzing all the loads and getting the 800, trying to get it certified. So this is around 78? Or 70? About 77. Okay, yeah. 77. Yeah. So Piper came out with the uh, new brochures for the Aerostar, and everything was pretty much the same. Uh, and about that time, 1980, uh, we, I had been there for a couple of years, and we got our first airplane certified, and we called it the Superstar. Uh, we couldn't use the name Aerostar, it was a trademark name, so we called it the Mockin Superstar originally, and that was in 1980. And you can see it had, it had updraft cooled engines because they were Navajo engines. And we had an intercooler in the inboard section of the wing, and this came from an aerodynamicist we were using at Boeing. And he said, well, let's put the intercoolers in the wings like the radiators on the de Havilland Mosquito. Right. It'd be really low drag and clean. And, and so they worked really well. And at the time that we, we were going to put in intercoolers, um, our other partner, Hugh Evans, was friends with the guys at Lycoming. And he told them, we're going to 
intercool the engine. They said, oh, Rude, that doesn't work. We've already done that. Huh. You know, well, right. if you don't do it right, it won't work. And so, we, you know, we're not the smartest guys in the world, but we did know about uh, declassified wartime reports on intercool and how you do it. And that, um, that makes a big, big difference. You know, you don't want a big pressure drop through the cooler on your induction system. And most intercooling systems that we saw that were out there were absolutely terrible. And we actually went to a big company, United Aircraft Products in Ohio, that made coolers. And, and we, we gave them... Of course, they know how to design a cooler. Well, when we got the coolers, my partner looked at it and just said, oh, God, this isn't going to work. And it was just a terrible manifold design. And I remember we had to find out what's the pressure drop through this cooler. So we ran some ducting out under the wing and ducted the cooler in there. And I'm running the engine at full power, and Steve's standing out there looking at the gauges. And he says, oh, it's, it's like a 10-inch manifold pressure drop through the cooler. So he had to redesign the manifolds for them and sent it back to United Aircraft Products and they made the they made the coolers and it was like a three man, inch manifold pressure drop, which was really good. And those coolers worked phenomenally and of course that was a big performance increase. Just putting the three fifty engines on from two nineties would make the airplane go about eight knots faster. Now before the Eurostar you did the Bonanzas, right? The J two B. We put a bigger engine in the Bonanza as Mach and Inc., but we never intercooled that engine. You never intercooled because they weren't pressurized; they weren't going to go high. Oh, okay. Thought. But it turns out they did want to go high, but um, they had enough engine to do it. <laughs> you know, they had plenty of engine, and uh, so we we started making these superstars, and we bought new engines. And at the time, new engines were fifteen thousand dollars each. Wow. <laughs> and as soon as we got it certified, <laughs> right, as soon as we got it certified, they raised the price to 30000 each. <laughs> and we thought, oh man, that's going to kill our sales. We were selling a Superstar, two brand new engines, intercoolers, counter rotating propellers, 75 grand. And so a lot of the airplanes were 19. 76, 77, 78, and they only had 300 hours on them. And so um, Piper now, they, they had an issue with 601P. And the problem was they weren't intercooled, the engines, and they were high compression, just like they are now. And originally, you couldn't get any power and altitude. But they kept improving the turbochargers and the, inter and the uh, wastegates. And eventually, you could get 27 inches up at 20,000 or 25,000. The first ones that were built, you started losing power at 15,000 in the climb. You couldn't get more than 29 and a half inches at 15,000. And when you pulled the props back, the manifold pressure went down to 20. So 20 inches and 2200 is all you could get at 15,000. Well, that wasn't good enough. So they started improving the wastegates and improving the turbochargers, the high altitude wastegates and turbos. And all of a sudden you get 27 inches at 24,000. Well, now the compressed air temperature coming out of those turbos is 270 degrees. And they were burning pistons on brand new Aerostars out of the factory. They'd come back with one feathered oil down the side of the airplane. And Lycoming said, hey, we're not going to warranty those engines. You guys are going to have to fix that before we're going to sell you any more engines. One option was to intercool the engine. And my partner Steve approached them, and that would have fixed the problem. But it was different. And Lycoming said, or you can just put in the low compression engines, and they'll tolerate that high temperature. And so that's what Piper did. They said, let's put in low compression engines. We'll raise the boost to get 290 horsepower. And they took the opportunity to reduce the RPM a little for noise. And they called it the Sequoia, yep. the Piper Sequoia, just like Comanches and 
you know, all the Native American Indian names. And I think they finally came to their senses and realized, no, let, let's not change the name. Let's call it a 602P Aerostar. And the 602P just had the low compression engine. That was the main difference. But they also took that opportunity to make uh, the airplanes, no icing, and they added all those, they called them, uh, they were standard factory options. If you want to buy an Aerostar, we're going to load it up with air conditioning and, and uh, no icing and everything. So the 602s had more options than the 601s, the standard equipment. But that was a big difference. So uh, we had customers call us and say, hey, can you make my 601 into a 602? And we thought, yeah, we could do that, but why would we stop at 290 horsepower? Because we knew what it would take to get it certified. We already certified one at 350. It's not that big a deal to go spend three days and get it certified at 325. So we went up to 325 horsepower, and we said, well, now what are we going to call this? Well, let's call it a superstar. Everybody wants a superstar. We'll call this the Superstar 1, and we'll rename the original one the Superstar 2, even though it came first. And that's what Piper did with the Cheyenne. They made the Cheyenne, renamed it the 2 with the bigger engines, and made the Cheyenne 1. So there was precedent for it. We didn't, I don't know that we even knew that at the time, but that's how it all came out. And, and so that was wildly successful. I think I sold 50 of them in the first year. Now yeah, that was the intercooler in the wing. Well, I hadn't I hadn't really done the intercooler yet. This was just the engine. Just okay. just put in low compression pistons, bring the airplane in, pull the cylinders, put in low compression pistons, hone the cylinders, put them back together. The only engine only had 300 hours on it. So that was a real winner for us and for the owners. And and of course Piper hated us because if you had a low time airplane and I said uh, hey Ken you ought to trade in your 1980 601P and we'll sell you a 602P and we'll you know you paid 300 for your airplane but it's it's older you know it's a couple years old it's got 300 hours on it we'll give you a couple hundred grand in trade on the new 602 which is 437,000 so you just cough up 237,000 in your airplane that you just got debugged after two years. <laughs> or you could call those guys out in Idaho or in Washington State at the time. And, okay. uh, yeah, and um, for $50,000, they'll give you 325 horsepower. Yeah. So we were a real You're thorn so in their done. side. Terrible. And, uh, and then they decided we got to have a 700 horsepower Aerostar. So Piper went to work in 1983, and they made a 700 horsepower Aerostar, two 350 engines. And they asked Lycoming for the same thing we did. They said, "Hey, we want to just we want to keep the same exhaust system, turbos, wastegate location, everything the same, and we just want 350." And Lycoming said, "Well." Um, we can do that for you, but you have to buy 50 engines. And, and, they, and, and in all fairness, they told us the same thing. You're going to have to buy, uh, actually, you said 100 engines. You've got to buy 100 engines, and we'll make that model. Well, we couldn't afford 100 engines. So we, we had to use the Navajo engine that they already had certified. But Piper said, no, okay, we'll buy 100 engines. And they certified the engine at 350 horsepower basically the same engine as our Superstar 1. So that allowed us to then go to the FAA and say, hey, now it's certified at 350, we got the same components, we showed them it's the same. So they allowed us to go up to 350 horsepower. But it was still a lot less than replacing both engines, which had now gone up to maybe 50 grand a piece for the engines. The 700 p was it the vision of Stuart Millar? Um, I think it was it was up in his time frame. Yeah, yeah. It was it was actually before Stewart bought the company. Actually. Okay, it was. They were working on it in Santa Maria in '81, and then everything moved to Vero Beach, Florida, in '82. But anyway, they they came out with the 700P, 
Um, and unfortunately, general aviation was going downhill then. Yeah. And you can see the, the drop in production, like the 82 airplanes were all 602s. There were only 48 built. Then 83, only 21 built. And then they actually built all the 84 models in 83. And they left them all sitting on the ramp in Vero Beach, Florida, and all the engines rusted. They were sitting outside, and almost all the 700 P's had had to have a top overhaul or something. So it was just a disaster for them. Um, mostly, mostly too many good airplanes out there. Car low time. Car engines. administration was going on about that time. 21 percent interest. Yeah. And that's, that's when all the piston twins pretty much went out of production as well. So um, aviation went downhill there, and um, eventually, you know, you couldn't, uh, you couldn't get any spare parts for the airplane. Piper had, they had the parts at vendors being made, but they didn't pay for them, and the vendors wouldn't ship the parts to them. And so... Stuart Millar owned the company at the time, and we had a pretty good rapport with him. He owned an Aerostar before he bought the company. Oh, did he? Okay. Yeah, 19, he had a 1980. And uh, we said, hey, we'd like to buy that type certificate. You guys aren't making the airplane. We'll support it. Well, uh, that didn't go over very well with Piper, but eventually, when he knew that they were going to file bankruptcy, he called us and said, hey, I'll sell you guys the company. Mostly because... This was 1991? It was about 1990. 90, and, okay. and he said, I'll sell it to you guys because you're the only ones I know that can maintain it. Right. And he didn't want to leave the Aerostar owners hanging. So, he unfortunately... Was, he even had a 700P at that time, right? They made him a new 700P, yeah. He had a 700P. Well, one of the last ones. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, the guys at Piper, we were down there... Um, he invited us to come down and consult with them on their Lycoming engine installation in the Malibu. Really? Yeah. Cool. Because um, we knew about intercooling and they were going to do that. So we went down there, and one of the first things we did was we met with the production manager, Vince Monturo, and we were walking around from one building to the next, and my partner Steve says, Hey, that's Stewart's. That's Stuart 700P over there. And Ben said, oh, yeah, damn thing. Uh. <laughs> he says, you know, he says, guys, the Aerostar is a BMW, and we build Chevrolets here. <laughs> it never fit in. It didn't look like a Piper. It didn't fly like a Piper. Yeah, they, they made it, but it was painful for them because it's all it flush ribbons. It was... Yeah, it was all flush rivets, and their uh, golden airplane was the Malibu. Okay, they developed it, they engineered it, and everybody saluted that. Very few people cared about the Aerostar that worked there. Well, during this time when you couldn't get you couldn't get a new Aerostar, and you couldn't get parts for the Aerostar you had, we were still doing Superstar Two conversions and Superstar 1 conversions. And we started adding the intercoolers to the Superstar 1. And then we said, okay, now what are we going to name this thing? Superstar 1 intercooled? And we said, let's start over and name them for the total horsepower. So the Superstar 1 with 325 horsepower became the Superstar 650. We added the intercoolers, and the engines were rated at 340. And then when the Superstar 2 got to be too expensive, we said, well, why don't we raise it all the way to 350? And we did. Um, and then we got some really cool propellers from Hartzell. And just having that picture and sending it out to people, I sold three Superstars. And the, but then we found out we couldn't get those certified because it caused a vibration in the airplane. But they looked really cool. And this was about, you know, it, people got excited about those things. They had scimitar tips and, you know, their four blades. And, 
that was one of our first superstars. And like Ken said, it has that was a superstar too. Um, but then later, you know, we adapted the intercoolers like that for the Superstar One. But then later, it was a lot of trouble to put those in the wings. And we said, you know, we need to make that a little more um, easily installed in the field. And of course, that means it's easier to us for us to install them too. So we didn't have the airplane down for three weeks, and you didn't have to. You could go to Don's place and get those installed in three or four days, versus three weeks of our guys messing with them. And you didn't want to fly clear across the country to buy a twelve thousand dollar intercooling system. Right. At the time, now they're like twenty some thousand. But. Was it a, was it a no icing airplane when it with it with the it wasn't it wasn't certified no icing yet when we certified that intercooler. Okay. But then later it became no icing and you couldn't get no icing without having a boot in that section of the wing. And so that was another reason to put them underneath the engine and leave that section of the wing uh, yeah, clean. Clean. Um, but we did throw in the in the certification that if you developed a boot for that section, it could still be no icing. We just never developed a boot for it because there weren't that many people that that wanted it. Yeah. Well. Um, I think that the 700P, I don't know this for a fact, but I think the 700P from Piper had counter-rotating engines, just like our Superstar, your airplane, and they were having troubles with pitch stability. More power makes the airplane less stable in pitch. We had already solved that problem. We put a bob weight on the elevator control cross tube so that when the air, so you trim it for 120 or so, and you pull up on the nose until you're just above a stall, release the control wheel, and see what happens. And it pitches over like a roller coaster and goes back through the 120, goes down to 160, and it pulls a little bit of G's and pitches back up and goes all the way up to about 95, and then it pitches down again. And the standard Aerostar did that. So it was pretty marginal to start with with 290 engines, and it didn't like the 350s. So we put the bob weight in there, and so the bob weight is sitting out in front of the cross tube underneath, it's near the rudder pedals. And the weight, side. I'd like to put it on the co-pilot side, but we did put some on the, on the pilot side. Yeah, on the pilot side. Okay. Yeah. And so the idea was when you pull up on the, it's just about to stall and you release the controls, the bob weight is going to push the nose over. And it'll still go through the trim speed, and when it starts down, you've got springs that are, that are uh, you've got the trim set for 120, so it's going to fly back up. But when it pitches back up hard, the weight gets heavier because of the G's. And what happens? It pushes the nose over. So instead of going 25 cycles before it started to converge, it went three. Bang. Wow. Was, and, and the other thing the FAA liked about that was the pitch force, or the stick force, per G, if you roll that airplane into a 60 degree bank, you could pull four Gs with your little finger on the standard Aerostar. They didn't like that. You could pull the wings off this thing if you were a little ham-fisted. So they wanted you to have to pull maybe 20 pounds to pull four Gs. The bob weight fixed that too, because when you're pulling four Gs, now all of a sudden that bob weight weighs uh, 32 pounds, not 8 pounds. So it, you have to really pull to pull 6 Gs. But anyway. Uh, it meets the stall warning requirements in the FARs because your, an aerodynamic buffet is a stall warning. Uh, you don't need that. I guess. The pilots hold on to the control wheel, they think, at the time. It, there's no requirement for an audible stall warning. It's just you have to have a stall warning. And it's five knots indicated. Um, yep, that's all you need. Well, four miles over one has a stall warning. It does have a vein out on the right wing tip, I think. 
but you don't technically you didn't need it. We got separation off the nacelles, shakes the tail, shakes the control wheel, you know. But it's it's right at the limit. It's five knots. It's not six knots, you know. So, <laughs> but it's five. <laughs> So anyway, Stuart sold us the type certificate, and so, you know, um, so what does Aerostar Aircraft do? Well, we do everything that Cessna does except build airplanes. We do everything that Piper does except build airplanes. We build spare parts. Um, we were in Spokane when we bought it, and we, we had, uh, actually, no, we were in Coeur d'Alene, and we, we bought uh, bought the tooling along with the type certificate, trucked everything up to... Uh, now, they had already filed bankruptcy, so they decided, the, uh, the lawyers down there decided, hey, you know what, we're going to keep all your money, and we're just going to make you guys creditors. <laughs> okay? Yeah, all right. <laughs> and we're going to leave the Aerostar owners hanging for another five years or however long, and we're not going to make any parts, and... So we hired a lawyer down there in Florida, and we litigated it, and fortunately, it went pretty fast, and we got everything, but we had to pay for the trucks to move everything from Florida. It was six semi-loads up to Coeur Lane, and we had the tooling, but we didn't get all the tooling. We didn't get the assembly fixtures for building the airplane. We just got the detailed parts tooling. So we can make parts now. And we called vendors and said, hey, we're going to send you a check. Can you send us these parts that have been on order forever? Oh, yeah, well, yeah, we can do that now. So um, so anyway, uh, what else do we do? Well, this is just one little small area where we have all the original drawings for the various parts. And then uh, there are some flat drawings that are in these file cabinets. And also in these file cabinets are all the engineering reports. Hey, what, what did you do to certify a 601P? Well, of course, it's all done. None of it's computerized. It's all done on graph paper and, and slide wheel calculations. Um, so we have that, and it's helpful with certification of various things like wing loads. You know, we know how they did all that, and in fact, Steve was one of the guys doing it for them on the 800. Um, and then along with, uh, these are just some of the templates that we pulled out of the tooling, that if you need a bulkhead or whatever, you know, you look in here, um, you might pull one out, it says T.R. Smith and Associates, 1968, and that's to make this bulkhead. Because a lot of the parts, uh, they were made with templates. They, they had non-dimension drawings, so you couldn't make the part from the drawing, you had to have the template. Anyway, we've, and so, uh, we make spare parts, okay? So in addition to, um, we and we have vendors that make a lot of these parts, and the, and the deal with the vendors is you have to give them a drawing, and they have to make the part according to a drawing, and we have, you know, stainless steel castings here, and then they get machined, and they become wastegates, all assembled. Um, and it's a constant hassle. You have to have an engineer. Because you send a drawing to somebody and he says, well, we, uh, you know, we, we can't do that process. We can't do cat plating. We've got to do this way. So you got to change your drawing so that it can make the part for you. So now you need an engineer. And now it has to go through the FAA because we can't change drawings without them approving it. So you got to have an engineering department um, in addition to people that can make sheet metal parts. And then most of your vendors, most of the, a lot of the parts are vendor control parts. And there's... Um, I guess, windows. I, if you have a Baron and you need a window, they can probably make you one in October. That's when they make windows. So, so we actually try to have, we actually try to make money by selling parts. That means you have to have the parts. And we also may have an Aerostar that we have for sale. And if we need a window, we can't wait six months to sell the airplane. We need to get it. So we have, we're in, in the same position you are, we need spare parts as much as you do normally. Um, and those are the turbochargers we just got in after waiting a year. Yeah. And there's just some of the stock room and all the little detail parts you need for various things. And, 
And we talked about the nose structure and how the, the nose uh, support structure for the Aerostar was never strong enough. This is the original, one of the original parts out of a 1971 airplane. And right here is where they're, they're commonly break because this is a hole they put in there so that they could put the retract rod for the nose gear through it. And of course, it's a weak area. And this is a, a, a bearing, uh, it's a bushing mount for a shaft that goes through there. And I'll show you, uh, well, this is just torque links. We, we bought all the torque links that Piper had made from the vendor and then they started breaking right here because they made these the same part and machined away half of it in order that they didn't have to make two parts. So two castings. It was a cast part back then. Yeah. yeah. And then we machined them out of solid, they had them machined out of solid billet and they were much stronger. And in fact, you know, sometimes the pilot, they blame the pilot. I made a hard landing, broke a torque link, you know, or broke a side base. No, they were never strong enough. The load on that tire and on that axle and on that torque link is about 4,000 pounds wow. when you hit a max G landing. Each one? Yeah, so it's like hanging a Chevrolet off the end of the thing. It's <laughs> got to take that kind of a load. So they were never strong enough. And part of the things that we do is, hey, we've got a problem. They want us to solve it. The FAA isn't going to solve the problem. They want you to fix the problem with the service board and service letter, and then they'll make that an AD if they think it's a good fix. So it's just another thing. Something comes up, okay, you better have an engineering department or a group that can figure out what are we going to do about this. Now, we also, you know, mostly manufacturers don't sell mods because they want to sell you a new airplane instead. Right, but this is a profit center for us. We're going to come out with improvements. Like um, we're going to try to make all the uh, known icing equipment so that so that you can put on your airplane, and then it'll be certified known icing. But right down here, you can see that we did have a problem with uh, the torque links and the side braces, and the side braces were never strong enough. We pulled out the old reports of when they did load testing on the side braces and since the landing gear just went in and out there's no load really on fore and aft because it was just pivoted at the top so they just put a piece of angle iron in there to do the load test well when things loosen up a little bit there is a load fore and aft because the landing gear is four feet long and when you touch down your, your tires are going from zero to 70 knots instantaneously, so there's a big drag load on the landing gear, and the side brace wasn't strong enough, and it broke the side brace, collapsed the gear, and it's an apollo air. The guy hit sideways. He wasn't going straight. Well, they never even tested the side brace, okay, because they didn't think that they needed to. So that was a very unusual thing we discovered when we started looking at the reports and so we made them a lot stronger, and that became an AD, and everybody It was has a cast them. part also. Yeah, they were, they were actually forged. They so forged. they were strong. They were strong, but the design wasn't robust enough. Okay. That was... Say again? Well, that one, that one was from our ex-partner, Hugh Evans, who made that mod. And I think it probably unloaded the side brace, but it was a pain in the neck to take apart and grease every time you needed to do that. With Sandy's plastic bushings now, maybe that would have been a lot easier. You know, you don't have to take it apart. You don't have to grease that thing anymore. And then we made bigger landing gear brakes. I asked the pilot, the test pilot, who flew the Superstar, and I said, hey, Dick, do you think we could sell uh, more powerful brakes for this airplane? Because he was a real marketing guy, real helpful he said, well, I'll tell you, this is the only airplane I know of that speeds up 10 knots when you hit the brakes. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we, we took that as a yes. <laughs> so we have a shop, and we can get about six airplanes in it. Uh, we don't really uh, solicit maintenance. We like to do mods because... Uh, we need to sell the mod kits, and we install them. And, of course, 
we try to make them so they can be installed in the field too, and mostly they are, most of them are, but some of these were airplanes that we owned and we were restoring. Um, speaking about restored airplanes, here's one we bought from Don Smith, and uh, it's exactly as represented. I had a guy go out there and pick it up, Bobby Watts, and uh, that's what it looked like in 79, and that was the interior when the airplane arrived. And that's what it looked like when we were done. And it had a nice leather interior and new instrumentation, and, and there was a market for this airplane. Um, but we were looking for a bigger market. And, you know, when you're looking for an airplane to look at your mission, okay, I want to go a thousand miles, I want to go from Michigan to Florida, and I'm going to take four people, and I need enough fuel to get there. When they look at the Airstar, I said, oh, it's useful load, it's not good enough, cross that off the list. So we thought, well, could we raise the gross weight on the airplane? Um, yeah, the wing's strong enough, the tail's strong enough. Well, what's going to be the limiting factor? Well, it's going to be the, the landing weight has to be within 5% of the takeoff weight. So we raised the gross weight to 68.91 ramp weight, 68.50, I think, uh, gross weight. And, but we had to raise the landing weight 500 pounds from 6,000 to 6,500. And we had to do the load testing, like I mentioned, on the nose gear and on the main gear. And the main gear was already done because they did it for the 800. And we knew what kind of valving to put in the main gear. And we said, okay, why don't we come out with a new name and maybe we'll get an article. And we did get a nice article in Flying Magazine. This was 2006. And we said, well, let's call it a 702P because when we restored airplanes, you know, we put in a new, we got certified the KFC 225 autopilot. We could make everything new, but we still had the old autopilot. So we got the autopilot certified, and the panel looked nice. It was state-of-the-art at the time, 530 stuff. And, um, but we still had the old autopilot, so we got that certified. And then we increased the cabin pressurization as well to 5.5 PSI. I don't know why we did that, because it wasn't required, but we just thought that should, that we can do it, and we just set up and cycled the airplane 25,000 times and fixed all the areas that were going to break or crack. First thing we did was blow it up and blew the emergency exit out clear across the hangar. <laughs> now that was at about 10 PSI, so it would have passed anyway for 4.25, but it didn't pass at 5.25 because you have to go double what you'll ever see. Okay, so that showed up with, uh, okay, but it's very low tech. You know, we had an engineer, and he said, well, we can model all this with Katia, and we can do this and that. And I said, really? And I know Steve was so practical. He said, no, we're not going to do that. And his name was Trenton Marvin. He worked for, the, he worked for um, Boeing before he came to us. And, you know, if it took a year at Boeing, that'd be just fine. I said, no, we've got to get this done. And Steve said, well, what we're going to do is we're going to do the same thing Aerostar did. We're going to put some, we're going to blow the airplane up, and we're going to uh, take it up to max two times the pressure, and then we're going to find out what breaks, and we're going to fix it, and we're going to blow it up again. And we're going to keep doing that until it passes. So we don't need to model it in a computer and all that stuff. But that's what I mean about Steve being very practical. Hey, why don't we just, we got all the reports here. Why don't we do what Piper or what Aerostar did years ago when they certified it? So we did that. And so we got the pressurization increase. That makes it modern. We've got the gross weight increase. Um, and those, by the way, are available on a separate STC. You don't have to have them all. You can have any or all of them. But then we... Um, then we said, let's give it a name, 702P, and I'll do a press release and try to get a magazine article written, because then you can fill the cabin, you can, you can carry the four people, you can have the ox tank, you've got the useful load, you can fill the tanks up, you can even overfill them and put a thousand pounds in the cabin. The only other airplane that would do that was a 421 Cessna. 
so all of a sudden we had some interest from people that never considered an Aerostar. We crossed that off the list. That's this it won't carry the useful load. Now it will. Okay. So we we started uh, promoting that a little bit, and those were the features and advantages of the 702. But we got a nice article in Flying Magazine. If you get online and look, just go to Flying Mag. Dot com and put in 702p, the article pop up. And that was 2006 at Sun and Front. I flew with uh, one, of the, one of the guys, and he did listen about, you know, a lot of the articles you read about in Arizona, oh, you got to climb over the pilot seat to get in. No, you don't. You slide it forward underneath the instrument panel. But a lot of them get overstuffed, and you do have to, you can't get the damn thing underneath the instrument panel. So, that became, you know, I spelled all that stuff out to the guy, and he realized, hey, this is really a nice, this is a nice way to get in. You don't have to hunch over and crawl up between the seats. The pilot, you just get step in. Step over the spar. Yeah, you don't have to step over the spar. There's, it's a flat floor. So anyway, we got a nice article, and, and uh, here's just a picture of the pressurization center console, just to remind me that there's some structural stuff you do. It's not just put in the valves. You have to make the airplane strong enough that it's it's going to withstand that pressure at double the pressure, like 12 psi. And we cycled it 25,000 times. Blew it up, put it contract. And when we did that, we did it with air. Um, but we also put big foam blocks in there so we didn't need to pump the whole thing up with a lot of volume. It just took the pressure up. Okay, pressure down, back and forth. Then we had to load the cabin with 4,000 pounds of lead and pull down on it and pressurize it with like a 4G pull-up to make sure the door and the emergency exit didn't pop open. You know, so But that's what they did, and we just followed the yellow brick road and certified it at five and a half. And one of the areas is the emergency exit. This is why the emergency exit blew out. You see, there's the retain, retainer for the pin, and it was riveted in with some rivets right here on top. Well, rivets don't like to be in tension. They like to be in shear. So we added these pieces here that captured that, and now these rivets are in shear holding that pin receptacle in place. And we had to change the pins the steel and the pins is Vasco Jet 990, real high tensile strength steel. And then uh, also right here, if you ever have your interior out, you look right here. This is an H channel. And what they did when they went over the, the back shelf is they just cut the bottom of the H off. Well, that's why we have this big doubler here to take those loads. So that cracked. Okay, and then the last thing we did was the Aerostar cabin, you know, like a Baron, after 10,000 hours, you throw it away, pressurized Baron, because it's life-limited fuselage. The Aerostar is no life limit on the fuselage. So in order to certify that with no life limit, we had to start making cuts in the frames, in the windshield retainer, when we pressurized it to max pressure, and to show that if it did crack, it's not going to explode. And therefore, a mechanic can find a crack, you know, on an inspection and fix it so it's fail safe. If it fails, it's still safe. It's one of the only airplanes certified that way. So when we get all done, we pressurize the airplane. We've got a 30 horsepower electric motor there, and we blow it up, and we find all kinds of places that, you know, could leak and we fix them. And, uh, and so that's more of a maintenance thing because you can make the airplane right back to original as far as leak rate. You know, it's, it's really well designed such that you can do that. Now, uh, the nose gear, you know, is, is kind of an area that we've done. Some, there's been service balloons on that nose gear since day one. It was never strong enough. And when we did the gross weight increase, we said, well, let's fix the areas that we know are weak. Um, and that was an area right there. I think I've got another picture. I'll just show you. This is the, uh, 
this thing is called the outer hat section right here. Well, right here is an, is an important thing, and that's where the pin goes that supports the drag brace. This is looking aft, with the nose gear doors open, the pin, the, the trunnions are here where the, the nose gear pivots on these pins here. And what holds it down? Well, this is the drag brace. And it goes right up here, and there's the actuator. And so when the actuator comes out, this pivots right here, and that lifts the nose gear up. Well, that pivot, there's actually, um, I'm going to go forward, I think. I'll just go back. That, that pivot is really, some airplanes have that pivot on both sides. Like a Bonanza, you see like a V where the drag brace comes down, holds the nose gear down. So there's there's kind of an equal load, but on this airplane, uh, when you when you move the nose gear fore and aft, it's put a bending load on this pin. It's it's going fore and aft, a bending load. And the whole idea of this structure is to support the bushings for this pin. Okay. And, and so when we do fix the outer, when we add the beef up to the outer part, like this one, because it cracks down in here too, that's a normal thing. Then a lot of times what we find is, uh, and as a mechanic, you see stuff like this, fretting, corrosion, or, you know, you see mud like that. That means that's working. Yeah, it's moving. And this up here, see, that's different. That's been replaced already. And this should be rivets, but they're bolts because it's easier to install bolts than it is rivets when this is all assembled. But none of it's too easy to start with. And so a lot of times when we bring one in to beef up the outer part, we find all this other stuff broken. And of course, now's the time to fix it all. And you can modify the existing drag brace and, or the inner hat section uh, you can modify that so it's stronger, but sometimes it's already broken. Here's your inner hat section right here, and that's where the rod goes through to open and close the front doors. And you can see it's already cracked in two there, because that's the weak area. So we end up changing that. And when you change that, um, you really have to have the skin off to do it properly. But here is... So, so here's the original bearing block, and that's the original structure that was around it. So we have ended up, we can add all this to that, or you can just buy a whole new one and put it in. And you can see we actually bridged across this hole and tied that into this piece so that it's not going to break there anymore. It's going to transfer the loads down here and all the way up here. And so all that's close tolerance bolt stuff. That's, so you, you don't want it to move at all, because once it starts moving, it's going to keep moving. I don't know what those numbers are. Sorry. I think the 499 is the one on the outside, and the 500 is the one on this inside. This would be the, this would be the inside beef up. And you can do this without uh, pulling the skin off, okay? I don't know if it's, I think it's, the 499 I think is the outboard one, the one on the outboard hat, and I think I have a picture, well, Jim, I think I have more on the nose gear, but. The 70, uh, 69 through 76, that panel that you're attaching that to is corrugated, by the way, okay? Does that need to be replaced as well? It doesn't need to be, but you might find out that the, uh, I think I might have a picture of that. No, I have it in, I've got some maintenance slides for that, but um, you might find out that some of this has been replaced before, and I have pictures of that, and they, they elongated the holes when they did it, so you end up changing that whole inner skin. Okay. And then you can use, I think 40,000 aluminum is just as strong as that Bondolite sandwich sure. material. Is 
So right. 77 and newer airplanes already have that already have that aluminum panel. So yeah. it was already approved. Did you do you see any statistically any difference between the strength of that panel? Uh, uh, Bondolite's real fragile. I thought so too. I agree. It doesn't tolerate elongated holes. Well, none of them really do. But now on the on the main gear, um, I think let's see if I have it. No, I don't have it. I have it in. I have some maintenance slides, but I thought we're not maintaining airplanes here. Why do you want to know about that? You know, but, uh, here's so here's a uh, this this part of the. Uh, landing gear cutout. So we're this part of the. We got the landing gear out of the well right now, but they tend to crack this skin right here. Okay, and then up here, I've seen them crack this skin too. Um, so we make a bigger doubler. We call it a horseshoe doubler. It goes around like that, and um, that's part of our gross weight increase because all of them are cracked. Yeah, <laughs> and some of them need a bigger doubler because it's. This crack has gone past, and most of them are patched, but the crack extends past the patch, so we make bigger and bigger doublers for them. And, and those are things that we did because all airplanes crack there, so let's just beef it up as part of the deal. Did we need to beef up the wing? No, we didn't. But this is kind of a wing beef up just because the skin carries some loads. And part of the gross weight increase is also um, <clears throat> these rivets have to be number six rivets, I think. Maybe they're just number fives, but we always find these loose. Sometimes we find these loose. This is your elevator connection to your yeah. torque tube. And then since the tail feathers are swept back 30 degrees, you've got to have a U-joint in here. And the U-joint has to be lined up properly. And I have seen where they weren't lined up, where one elevator goes up more than the other one yeah. when you put the elevators in. But that's part of the gross weight increase. Then we pull all the landing gear apart and change the valving in the nose gear and the main gear struts. And we use higher speed and higher strength tires on the main gear. And you have to have the, the bigger brakes. That's not included, but you have to have it. And you have to have the service bullet on the aileron bell cranks because that's a weak area, too, where the, the rivets were actually loaded in, in uh, tension. And they get loose. And so now we put bolts in there instead of rivets, and they're good for tension. Now, the, this gross weight increase is not available on the 700P, correct? Uh, we didn't get it certified on the 700P. Yeah. There's uh, not enough of them still out there. And, you know, you probably couldn't do this today. This was done with the rogue agent. <laughs> <laughs> They'd want, they want a whole new wing analysis and everything, just like they did on the winglets. But, of course, none of that was done to start with, and it was all fine. But So uh, <clears throat> so then we we started promoting this as the 702, and um, so we got the 5.5 PSI cabin pressure. Then we said, why not go to 30,000? And I've had the airplane to 30. I've had it at 31,000 and done all those steep turns and stalls and everything up there, and the FAA was real happy with it. And uh, but then the RVSM kicked in. We're now limited to twenty-eight thousand. Right. Um, a lot of the airplanes, a lot of these kits, they're pretty. Mature, airplanes are pretty mature, and they already have all this stuff. So there's not a lot that we can do other than what we've done recently. Like, um, oh, we we also made the autopilot part of the gross weight increase. Uh, but then we decided, you know what? We don't really need an autopilot. So why are we going to restrict the auto? Why are we going to say you have to have the autopilot? You don't have to have an autopilot. So you at can all. do the gross weight increase with a, a KFC. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And and KFC two hundred was checked off the list. I'm not sure about the Century Four, but so turn it off. Well, you're not going to do that, of course, but <laughs> that's, say, well, the roof's not certified. Well, then turn it off. If you want to run at that high gross weight when you're up at 28,000. So it's not a requirement that you have the autopilot certified, but this one definitely was certified at the high gross weight at 30,000 
be the FCG limit. And then, of course, uh, you need the auxiliary fuel tank for the high, if you want the range at high gross, high useful load or high gross weight. That was an airplane that uh, was a beautiful airplane. That was the red one that we got. Um, I think a customer bought it. You know, actually, I think a customer bought it, had it delivered, and it was as represented. It was a nice straight airframe, but just needed cosmetic stuff. And uh, and we did one for another guy. Um, we did several of these, but then um, these airplanes would go out the door for a total investment of about 800 or 900 grand. Brand new engines, brand new props, gross weight increase, pressurization increase, avionics, paint, interior, all the mods, air conditioning, whatever it didn't have, it got. And this is just an example of a really nice airplane. I bought this one from Bob Pinto. It was 601 uh, Bravo Pop. And uh, the guy called me and he said, hey, I'm thinking about buying Aerostar. I said, oh yeah? Well, what kind of airplane do you have now? He said, well, I've got a uh, Diamond Twin Star. <laughs> and they had just landed one with a double engine failure over in Germany. Uh, and I said, well, how's that working out for you? He says, well, I think I'm going with proven technology this time. I said, okay, well, I've got an airplane that I bought and, and I'll sell it to you for 100 and 20 grand. And he said, well, there's another one down in Florida, and it only has 1,800 hours on it, and da, da, da. And I said, yeah, okay. He says, well, which one do you think I should buy? And I said, well, I think you should buy the one in Florida. He said, well, why would you think I should buy that one? I said, well, that way, if there's anything wrong with the airplane, you get to pay for it. We've already fixed ours. He said, well, I think I'll buy your airplane. Do you want a project or do you want to fly? <laughs> well, she said, Make up your well he made it a project, all right. You know, um, he That's wanted everything Jack. everything like new. And um, he did tell me one time, after it was all done, he said, now, if there's anything else you could do to make it more like new, just do it. And we changed all the windows, windshield. I think it was only a 2,300-hour airplane. Two factory new engines, all the options. Um, there's a picture of the engines before it went on the airplane. Of course, it had had every option. It had the Inconel exhaust pipes on there, and you know they don't have a, a clamp there, which is nice. You don't have that AD issue with that one. And the oil breather was a mod that has been very successful. Um, because brand new Aerostars come back from a test flight in the factory and they're dripping oil off the tail cone. It was blowing oil like mad because the breathers didn't really work. And the breathers weren't very sophisticated. There was just a can up there that was angled up. So when the breather came out, you're relying on the oil to run back down into the engine. Well, it all blew out the breather. None of it ran back in the engine. So we decided to put a, a suction on that can and and a drain line. And then, of course, we had to put a check valve in it so the oil could never go backwards, uh, back up into the can or overboard. And uh, we sold a ton of those. And it basically, it was we copied the Cessna 340 can. And but we, we were looking for a place where there was suction on the engine so we could suck the oil back out of the can. And there wasn't one. We instrumented the, the scavenge pump. When you were turbocharged, that scavenge pump was positive pressure on the intake. It wasn't going back into the engine. So we made a motive flow valve like a, a blow gun where you, you have a venturi and the flow sucks, has a hole in the venturi going to the line that sucks oil out of the can. And that's worked pretty well. And so right now, um, we're doing some maintenance and mods on airplanes. We're not doing any restorations right now because customers are selling them for half the cost of what it would take to do it. So it is a good time to buy an Aerostar. And hopefully uh, you don't need engines right away because they're kind of hard to come by right now. And this is one that came in and I think 
Joel, you might recognize this one. It, um, the doctor, didn't it sit at your place for a long time? Oh, okay. Yeah, it needs. It still needs a lot of work, but they finally decided they were going to get the airplane. And but he didn't fly it very much. And Eric Reese told him just get it in there and let him fix it. And this is another one that just came in. That was advertised on the Aerostar Mark, and it had 1,100 hour engines on it. Um, we found seventy thousand dollars worth of things that were unairworthy on it, and um, fixed them all. And he went out and flew the airplane for his recurrent training. Two hours later, he came back with a cracked case on a J on a U two A engine. Somehow the and we started looking at it. Did a compression Wait, check. It, it cracked way up where the lifters are on the top front. Of the engine, one there. and we looked in there with a bore scope and saw the cam was kind of ragged and it, it had broken a lifter. And the cam lobe, and we pulled the pickup. We already pulled the pickup screen when it came in, and it was clean as a whistle. Mm -hmm. Pulled the pickup screen, it's full of metal, so it trashed the whole engine. And fortunately, Joel had one overhauled one that that uh, he bought and sent it out here. And so we're putting that new engine on, it'll be good to go when we get that done. But this is one other mod we've done, and um, just the auxiliary heating system, where we bypass the uh, intercooler in the wing. This is a bleed air intercooler, and we just bypass it. And that's variable, you can adjust the temperature. Unfortunately, you couldn't put it through the heater because it was too hot. And, and the heater is a great big stainless heat sink. So if you put that hot air through the heater, it comes out cold. And all that plumbing gets there. Yeah, so we had to make this other device so that when when we're using blade air heat, it dumps it right into the heater ducts right here. Now the original Aerostar, pressurized Aerostar, had a knob you pull out, and there was a door that blocked the airflow into this cooler. And so when we first, we hadn't done an R&D project in years. And so we said, hey, why don't we just make that a solenoid operated door and we can charge a couple grand for it and sell it to everybody. Oh, that's great. So we put, made that door and that solenoid operated and went out and flew it. And yeah, the door's closed, but it's still cold air coming in here. What's going on? Okay, well, let's go back to basics. Take that... Uh, bleed air and just bypass the cooler totally. And now it's warm at least. And now let's just dump it into the cabin instead of going back through that stainless steel cooler. And now it was 250 degrees. So we had to bypass, oops, we had to bypass um, the cooler mostly completely. And then we still had to dump it into the floor outlets and now all of a sudden, the parts list went up exponentially. And but now it works, and you once you're at altitude, you don't need a heater. That thing puts out as much or more air as the hot air as the heater would if it were running. Well, the first thing that happened is a big cooler like that radiates a lot of heat, even with no airflow through it. But the main thing that happened was the hot air could be coming in at 90 degrees, but by the time you went through that heat sink in the back and all the way forward, it was down to 40. It might keep you alive, you'd be miserable, but, um, but we said, well, if we're going to have to charge all this money to make it work right, we better make it work as good as the heater. So that's how those things go sometimes, you start in and get an education. Now, the, uh, somebody asked me about, uh, did we use a computer to do the winglets? And we hired a company that had a computer program, and they told us, okay, this is the angle on the, computer, on the winglet that you need. This is the airfoil shape you want. And so it's a blended airfoil. It goes from the wing, whoops, goes from the, the wing, 
airfoil blends right into an airfoil up to the tip, and they could they could determine what's the drag on the wing tip, what's the uh, lift created in this area. And so anyway, they they have a big program. They were bought by Boeing recently because they can do stuff for big airplanes, and they were doing initially. They did uh, for Aviation Partners. They did all their stuff for the uh, Gulf Streams. So when it came out, it, it looked really good. And, you know, the initial, I got a lot of interest in winglets from customers, owners of Aerostars, who said, well, I really want to have winglets. Well, okay, we'll make winglets, but if we're going to make them, we're going to make them as, as good as they can possibly be. So we hired these guys to do the uh, design. And they came out really well, and, uh, you know, absolute worst case scenario is it slows the airplane down. We didn't want that, and if anything, at, at 140 indicated, it is faster. At 170 indicated, it's not any faster, because you're really reducing the induced drag, the drag due to lift, and you have most of that drag at higher angles of attack. So, at high-speed crews, they don't, they, they are more directionally stable, like if you lose an engine, BMC is a little lower. Uh, did we take credit for that? No, because now you got to recertify the whole flight right. manual. You know, for two Here knots. You go again. <laughs> yeah, so I'll we didn't it. take credit for that. But so that was that's a been a. I think we sold sixty five or seventy of them now, and it seems to be um, looks looks cool, and it and it improves the performance a little bit. Well, I think the biggest difference is in the six hundred. With the wing extension. Well, yeah. that was a huge improvement. Yeah. yeah. That, that made a real airplane out of it. Yeah, that really helped a lot. Bob Lepper had that, and he said he never has to use flaps for takeoff now. Yeah. It's, uh, so it's much fast. gets to uh, climb speed much faster after lift on. Yeah. Yeah, that's, it, I measured one. It's, it's hard to get a perfect day to do the same airplane before and after, but I did have a chance to do it on a 601P, and I went, went straight to 17.5 and started the stopwatch at around 4,000 feet because we're at 2,300. So I got all stabilized, stopped, started the watch, leveled it, set, when I got to 17.5, stopped the watch, and did the baseline, did the cruise speed, and came back, put the winglets on, same airplane, three days later, did it again. It was 10 degrees centigrade hotter, and it was within one second of the climb. So it made up for a 10 degree centigrade day, having the winglets on there. And then in cruise, that airplane was indicating 140, 142 or something initially. Low power, 2422 on a 601P, 65%. And then it indicated... Uh, 145, 146. So it's four knots indicated at 17.5, and it would be better up high. But when you're indicating 170, it's mostly parasite drag, not induced drag. Okay. So they're not going to help. Uh, but it's never slower. And then we talked about air conditioning. One of the first things we did was air conditioning on the Aerostar. The guy on our first superstar said, oh, he was from North Carolina. He says, well, I'll do it, but you guys got to put in an engine-driven air conditioner. He said, okay, how hard could that be? You know, we're putting engines on. <laughs> well, we determined that the, big, the biggest factor was the overhead duct. That was the big problem. You could feel cold air coming out, but there wasn't enough volume to cool down the cabin. So by, by adding... Uh, outlets up front, this is where the speaker used to be. And by adding outlets up there, we moved the speaker back here and we had to bump it down a little bit to get the airflow up there around it. Um, we doubled the airflow into the cabin with that duct. And of course, we have it um, in the back. We have, you know, the 1955 Chevrolet outlet back there. Yeah. And uh, that gives you a lot more airflow, but also um, we disconnected this box from the back. It's, it's an internal separation thing, but um, that made the air conditioner work better as well. I remember that 
one of the engineers at Piper said, uh, that we were trying to sell them the air conditioning system, okay, and and because we had engineering air before they did, and we went down to Florida, and it was like 40 degrees on the ramp that day, so we couldn't even demonstrate it. But uh, I remember we, we talked about this with one of the engineers before we got down there, and he says, did you guys do a speaker survey? What? We just moved it from there closer to your ear. It should be better, right? No, well, did you do a speaker survey? And I was talking to Bobby Ellison at the time. And I said, can you imagine, Bobby, they wanted a speaker survey? He says, well, UPS guy thought it looked pretty good in there. You know, just just tell him, yeah, we, we surveyed the UPS guy and he liked it. So you can, they, can get, they can get so bogged down on ridiculous stuff, you know, sometimes that we think, we, it never occurred to us to see if the speaker worked better. We're all wearing headsets anyway. But. <laughs> so anyway, Ted's vision there, designing an affordable piston twin, well, it's we're just trying to keep it the fastest, safest, most dependable, and comfortable airplane. He already designed it that way. It has, you know, a fantastic... Uh, lateral stability and longitudinal stability now and it's really a nice ride for passengers and you've got plenty of horsepower to fly it on one engine and they even increase the gross weight 785 pounds and it still does better than a 601p did so that's we're just trying to maintain the airplane and uh it's the only airplane you can put two jet engines on and go fly 150 knots faster than what it flies with piston engines. Here's a picture of uh, my friend Rob Zahn. He worked at Aerostar the same time I did. Um, he's indicating uh, 240 or 280, 400 knot ground speed. We're doing about 375 knots there. And before we did this, I talked to Steve and said, hey, what about what's our really, what should we run for indicated speed? And um, he said, well, you know, I'd keep it at 200, around 200, but then he looked at the, I forget what they call this chart, where it's the G loads and the gust loads and all that. He says, well, 260 is no problem. You can run 260 indicated, but before he looked at the chart, he said, why don't you keep it around, you know, 200 or so. I said, well, too late. <laughs> We've already been to 240 at high altitude. So that's all I have as far as uh, presentation, and I don't know how we're doing on time. We oh, we're, we're, we're into our lunch time, but that's okay. fine. We're, we're enjoying this. Jim, I have a question for you about the dorsal fin. Why why did they come out? Is it just a sexy look at the dorsal fin? I think so. I mean, Dick Reese talked about that once. I think it just, he just liked the looks of it better. Okay. And it's an inlet for the heater, okay. you know, inlet for the cabin ventilation system. And some of the slides I have, I'll just quickly show. See, this is what you have to do to to uh, fix that structure inside the nose. And we can look at some of these if you want during the maintenance. Okay, let's do. Yeah. That would be great. Okay. I, I did coming back from Oshkosh. I I got up there 28 and route over Montana, and I said, uh, "Hey, we're not RVSM requesting 300." It's kind of quiet for a minute, and the guy came back and said, uh, "Approved." Why don't you check with the next controller? And I'm like, hey, yeah. <laughs> I said, "Okay, we'll check with the next controller." And and I said, uh, "I said, checked in," and he said, uh, "You are you?" He already got the word. He said, are you requesting 300? I said, yeah. He said, well, how long are you going to be up there? I said, well, not very long. We're just doing a flight check, you know. Okay, cleared the 300 and uh, let me know when you want to start down. And we were just out of Missoula, Montana. No, we were further Billings, Montana. There's nothing out there. And uh, we're cooking along about 375 knots. 
And it was the only time I was able to go max continuous thrust without going way over the indicated yeah. speed. And uh, anyway, we, he said, well, uh, a little while later, you, you guys ready to head down? I said, no, I'd like to go a little closer. It's pretty nice up here. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like it. He said, okay, just uh, tell me when you race. Because in the jet, the minute you start down, your true air speed goes down. So, and you don't worry about shock cooling anything. And when you, I'd, I'd like to go to about no more than 50 miles. Now in the Aerostar, you want to start down at 100 miles out, right? But I go to 50 miles, bring them back with flight idle, pitch it over to 200 indicated and come down 2,000 feet a minute. Don't need Speed brakes would bring it down faster, but I really haven't needed them. But it's a different animal. You better go straight to altitude, set up cruise, and go as far as you can and come straight down. You know, when people say, well, engines are more efficient at high altitude than low altitude. Yeah, that could be some of it. But what I found is that it takes a certain amount of power, and I can just use the fuel flow for the power. I just set... 50 gallons aside, and it's going to indicate 245 or something like that, you know, 235. And um, it doesn't matter what altitude you're at. But what does matter is true airspeed. That's right. or your true airspeed up there at 235 is, you know, uh, 375 knots. And down low, it's 235. So you want to stay up there just so your true airspeed stays up, and then at the last minute, you just bring them to idle and pitch over, and then you're going like mad downhill. But, um, yeah, it's, it's a little different. And, you know, I still enjoy flying the piston airplane just as much. It doesn't really spoil you, except if you're trying to go somewhere. You know, you think, well, let's see, what's the current weather? Okay. Uh, what's the forecast? Well, I'm going to be there in an hour. <laughs> It's 300 miles away. I'll be there in an hour. 325 miles, you know. You don't need to worry too much about the weather changing three, four hours later. That's a plus. And it climbs 4,000 feet a minute at, at 200 indicated yeah. when you're light. Been you know. there, done it, and seen it. There's a now. Well, you know, we thought there would be a market for retrofit, but the engines are so expensive and... And they've gone up double since we built it. And now they're out of production. So you'd have to put a Williams engine on it or get a used uh, Pratt Whitney. Those are Pratt Whitney engines. And, um, I, you know, it's probably, it's still maybe viable if you ever sold the design to some third world country that wanted to build their own airplanes, license them to build it. Because it is, they could use it as a military trainer. You know, we told, we used to know a guy, Dick Taylor, he's passed now, but his son, Steve Taylor, was head of the BBJ program at Boeing. And I told Steve one time, hey, why don't you guys just factor in a, an Aerostar jet, kind of a little spiff for the pilots when they buy a BBJ. <laughs> That's right. Call it trainer. It's a training airplane because the engines are in the right place, you know. It was only, I said, we could do it for like two and a half million bucks. And you guys are charging 130 million for an airplane. You know? Anyway, thanks. We'll talk okay. later. Thank you, guys. Thanks.